From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Charter Communications explains vendor breach. Chat GPT can fix bugs in code, but IT leaders still don't trust it. And Microsoft grants Fisher's verified cloud partner status. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's cybersecurity headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and expertise on these stories and more from our guest, David Nolan, the VP of Enterprise Risk and Chief Information Security Officer at Aaron's. David, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Rich. Real excited to be here. Before I move on, we of course have to thank our sponsor, Hunters. Mitigate real threats faster and more reliably than SIM. Join us on YouTube Live. Remember, just go to CISOseries.com. You can hit the events drop down and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. Count it. It's the one, two, third one down. Just click on it to join us. We've got about 20 minutes, though, so let's jump right into it. David, Charter Communications says vendor breach exposed some customer data. The telecommunications company said one of its third party vendors suffered from a security breach after data from the company showed up on a hacking forum. The data apparently includes names, accounts numbers, addresses, and more from about 550,000 customers. A spokesperson for Charter stated they do not believe that any customer proprietary network information or customer financial data was included, but did not respond to follow-up questions about what third-party vendor was hacked, when it occurred, or when affected customers were notified. You know, David, obviously stories of data breaches due to third-party vendors, nothing new. We, we cover these quite frequently on the show, but maybe that's a bit of the problem. Obviously, companies need third-party vendors, but when a breach happens, don't they have an obligation to customers and investors to be more forthcoming? I'm, I'm thinking about uh, LastPass here, for example, right? Yeah, I think the focus here is you know, third parties continue to be risks uh, to, to all companies. Um, it's something we need to all focus on. Think, things haven't changed since the target breach. It's it's really gotten gotten much more. So um, companies are continuing to outsource various parts of the business, various parts of IT, and we continue to, to turn to the cloud for these solutions. So um, I, I think we need to continue to, to look beyond our own walls and increase uh, our visibility into these third parties and how we protect our data and systems. It's really despite where the risk actually sits, um, we need to continue to focus on it and uh, manage it as well. All right, next up here, ChatGPT is now finding and fixing bugs in code. Researchers from Johannes Gutenberg University and the University College London have found that ChatGPT can weed out errors with sample code and fix it better than already existing programs designed for just that task. They gave 40 pieces of buggy code to four different code fixing systems and asked, What's wrong with this code? They discovered that really the ability to chat with ChatGPT, it's kind of chatbot functionality, after receiving the initial answer made the difference, ultimately leading to ChatGPT solving 31 questions and easily outperforming the others. Uh, you know, with, with everyone kind of simultaneously amazed and terrified at the potential of ChatGPT, David, you know, it's just generative AI in general is just such a new category that we're still trying to wrap our heads around. Do you see this engine as a way to diagnosing software development problems, or are there any red flags here? This one reminds me of when we all first started adopting cloud. There's there's lots of fear here, but I think there's lots of potential value too, depending on how you look at it. So I think there's ultimately a balance though that, that we got to look at this, uh, especially from the security side. Um, but first, there's lots of potential. You know, it's uh, how it can supplement the challenging work we do. Uh, and we perform on a regular basis. So think like automation of mundane work, solving security problems, this example with with uh, bug um, uh, detection and things like that. So um, many developers today start, I know I did, when they start to code, you start with Google. Now maybe they're just gonna start with AI and, and that will be the way that the code starts. And, and while I'm healthily optimistic uh, that there's some um, benefits here. There's definitely some known uh, security uh, risks. Um, with this specific story, companies need to understand the risk of submitting their code to a public AI. Um, Forbes, Forbes actually did an article um, earlier this week where they raised some concerns of providing um, the private data, IP, things like that uh, to chat GPT for this exact instance. And I think it raises a good point. Like when you're putting your, your company test data, your company code, or really any any sort of uh, sensitive stuff into these uh, chat GPT collections, we, we got to understand what the potential risks are for that. Um, the risk landscape has now increased. And uh, it's to levels that we've never really explored in this industry. And uh, I think our discussions on this topic have really only just started. 
Yeah, and and what I always think about is that ChatGPT is a generalized service, right? This wasn't something designed to have any kind of security application, and it's providing at least the potential for value to organizations. So I, I think of the future when this is licensed to a, a security vendor, to Microsoft, obviously, uh, is already heavily uh, invested in this space, and they create a product that has the, uh, you know, the... Um, the contract level agreements and, and all that stuff where they or the service level agreements is what I'm thinking of, where they can say the code's not going to be used. It's trained on these security data sets and give more uh, uh, less of the AI hallucinations. Right. That we've uh, we've already seen playing out uh, quite a bit in a lot of this early chat GPT stuff. Yeah, I think your your mind's in the right area. Um, it, it's one of those. It's the fear of unknown. I think we're all just worried about it, right? And and our knee jerk reaction, of course, is is to block it. But um, I, I think we need to start with knowledge, understanding where we're coming from, and apply a lot of the stuff that you mentioned as well. All right, next up here, Microsoft grants Fisher's verify the cloud partner status. Researchers say that threat actors recently used unprecedented sophistication to obtain verified publisher status through the Microsoft Cloud Partner Program. Then they began spreading verified malicious OAuth apps to infiltrate the cloud environments of organizations in the UK and Ireland. Microsoft soon disabled the malicious apps and associated publisher accounts and made improvements to its MCPP vetting process. So, David, the specifics of their unprecedented sophistication was the threat actors registered as publishers under displayed names that mimic legitimate companies. I mean, basically, it kind of sounded like typo squad and you'd have masquer if you want to masquerade as Acme LLC, you would do Acme Holdings LLC or something like that. Uh, obviously, Microsoft is quickly working to fix this on their end, but I'm curious, what can organizations learn from this? Yeah, I think the word unprecedented is uh, a little overused <laughs> in this one. But but yeah, I just love that it, attacks, good attacks don't have to be complex, right, uh, to work. Um, but this is a classic risk of targeting that authoritative institution and, and how inherent trust um, can really, inherit trust from us can can also be a weakness. Um, I, I think of this example of like, it's the same concept of users trusting websites with a lock icon, right? And it's one of those things that we trained them for years. And when our core trust methods are targeted, like in this case, it makes our jobs much more difficult. Um, and this re just reinforces that need for all those additional layers of security that we put on top of these, these trust areas. Um, and, you know, just beyond um, the third party trust mechanisms, we need to go further than that. Next up here, KillNet launches German DDoS. According to security firm Cato Security, the threat group KillNet attempted to organize a DDoS campaign against German targets in response to their supplying tanks to Ukraine. The attacks were against financial institutions and some law enforcement agencies. This also comes as the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center reported that DDoS attacks against financial firms in Europe increased 73% on the year, pretty much more than any other region, largely due to geopolitical considerations. I mean, you know, who would have thought a, an organization called Killnet could be so mean spirited, David? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we've seen many examples of retribution against countries assisting in the defense of Ukraine since the invasion started. Do you feel this become maybe a, an a influence on even foreign policy, you know, creating an unwillingness to help knowing that this will, you know, these, these cyber events might be a follow on incident? Or is, is this just going to be the cost of uh, existing in a country operating in a foreign theater at this point? Yeah, I, I think that's certainly the attacker's goal, right, to, to dissuade. Um, but to me, this one underscores really that cyber attacks can be a very popular geopolitical weapon. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, bombs and tanks and guns anymore. Um, and these particular attacks, they, they may have resulted in small disruptions, but it really shows that cyber weapons are quickly deployed responses to these types of situations, uh, to these physical actions that nation states uh, take. And and this one's, um, as you say, kill net. Um, it really proves that even these small hacktivist uh, groups can have a very big voice on the global stage. And this is something that, you know, just historically was done by nation states and uh, everyone's got a voice in the cyber world. Yeah, and, and it's one of these things where I, obviously the relationship of kill net to uh, you know, Russia or, or any other uh, uh, nation state is never going to be fully spelled out. These are surreptitious, surreptitious relationships. But I imagine what we've seen also from North Korea is that it, it takes a very little funding to get these groups off the ground versus the damage that they can do, even if it's just consuming time for financial institutions, for private companies, uh, you know, for for government agencies and stuff like that. Uh, that they can incur costs far exceeding any kind of you know capital outlay from whoever is backing them, right? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think the 
um, call it the challenge to attribute these attacks, as you inferred with nation state alliance yeah. here, um, is is a is a big plus for the people doing the attacks, right? So you've got the plausible deniability where if you you launched a missile from somewhere, you know, geometry, you can trace that back and you can you can figure out where it's coming from. In this case, even if you've got a, a mountain of evidence, they can play dumb and say, hey, it wasn't us, it was this other group. So yeah, I, there was there was a story this week, I believe it was about the Lazarus group. I think it was related to crypto uh, hacking or something like that. And like literally like they had this line because they have to ask, you know, the North Korean embassy or, or, or government or whatever for comment, a spokesperson. And they just said, what's Lazarus? Like, literally, that was the quote. Like, what's, what's, and it was just like, of course, because that's why these organizations exist, right? Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, before we move on, of course, we have to thank our sponsor, Hunters. Hunters is a complete SOC platform, purpose built for your security operations team. Hunter's brand new IOC search is a game-changing search tool that determines if a known indicator of compromise has been in your organization's environment without needing to write a single line of code. Type an IOC into the search bar, hit enter, and get results within seconds. Visit hunters.ai to learn more. DocuSign brand impersonation attacks target thousands of users. Researchers have spotted a brand impersonation attack targeting over 10,000 users by mimicking a common DocuSign workflow action. The emails have been shown the ability to bypass both Microsoft Office 365 and Proofpoint email protection solutions. While the email sender's name closely resembles legit DocuSign communications, the email address and domain show no association to the company, which though can be hard to spot, especially when you're using a mobile device. You know, again, David, nothing new here, uh, try, trying to slip in through email. Why is it not possible, I guess, to enforce a gap to get people to access documents, I guess, without clicking on links provided by the sender? Is this a technology weakness or a training deficiency, do you think? I mean, it's it's both. Um, it, it was mentioned earlier this week on the uh, CISO series podcast. Um, are controls there to protect the users or are users the last line of defense for failed controls? And I, I really think both are needed. So this particular example, though, it's, it's really a struggle between convenience and security with DocuSign. Um, it's targeting something that many business folks get on a recurring basis, uh, similar to like a OneDrive link or something like that yeah. that we may get. And there is alternatives that exist here. So the technology thing um, does exist, uh, but it's less convenient. So just because you review DocuSigns or you get FedEx delivery notifications for your job, it, it doesn't mean you should trust that content, of course. And I, I think companies need to continue to educate the, the users, as, as you're inferring, um, to go to the, the original source, um, take that take that code that DocuSign provides and, and go through it that way. Um, the control's there for a reason, but, you know, DocuSign's in the business of making a convenient way to send documents. So that's part of the risk. I mean, there's a reason we all retired our fax machines, right? <laughs> except What's a, uh, if you're What's in Japan, a fax machine? <laughs> if you're in Japan, exception is made for you. I apologize. All right, David, before we uh, – this next story, kind of a two-parter, so hold on, but relevant, I think, to combine these two. First up, the city of London on high alert after a ransomware attack. A suspected ransomware attack on a key supplier of the trading so uh, trading software of the City of London this week appears to have disrupted activity in the derivatives market. Reports suggest 42 clients have been impacted by the attack on the provider Ion Cleared Derivatives, whose software plays a key role in derivatives trading around the world. It's been linked to a prolific lockbit group we've covered on the show before, which recently caused major disruptions to Royal Mail, among other nefarious activity. This is kind of combined with another story. Watchdog warns that FDIC fails to test banks' cyber defenses effectively. The FDIC's Office of Inspector General, or OIG, identified major deficiencies in the FDIC's IT and cyber risk assessment program, which is known as Intrex. This includes things like outdated information, agency examiners not completing tests, staff not being kept up to date on latest cyber threat updates, and no training for examiners to reinforce Intrex procedures. You know, so David... City of London derivatives market hack reveals how important the trading markets, uh, you know, can, can create butterfly effects similar to, I guess, to what we've seen in supply chain uh, uh, in that regard. You know, just a lot of interconnected things there that can be disrupted seemingly very easily. And then we can see how major financial infrastructure players like FDIC appears to not understand the severity of security within their own walls. The OIG is you know, listed some steps to remediate these, and FDIC says they're going to comply with most of them by the end of this year. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts about these stories? Yeah, I think the the first one, 
illustrates attackers are going to continue to focus on areas like financial markets in this case. Um, and, and their goal is just like every business to make a profit. So they're going to continue to pit, pivot and um, you know point at those things, whether it's core financial institutions or other targets they believe are not cyber resilient, like you're, you're mentioning um, with the other piece. They're going to point their lasers at whatever area they can disrupt. Um, that may lead to that ransom payment. Um, of, of course, we've we've recently seen um, with bigger disruptions. So think Colonial Pipeline um, that may draw more negative attention, um, may be unwanted. So some attackers are still, of course, going to balance this. But I think it reiterates uh, hardening our own companies is really not enough. We need to partner with our vendors to harden our integration points between these third parties um, and other key areas uh, where our key data or systems uh, may exist outside of our walls. So. Um, the FDIC piece uh, is is kind of a classic. I think we can learn that uh, private and public uh, alike really need to be focused on our modern threats. Um, we need to, to figure out what reasonable controls and maturity uh, we need to be holding ourselves to, um, not just from the, the regulators and otherwise. But it additionally reminds us that um, investing in keeping our teams abreast of modern topics and growing their skills is something that can often be overlooked as a key investment. And that's really unfortunate. All right. Our final story here, foreign states already using chat GPT maliciously. That's what at least UK IT leaders believe. Most UK IT leaders believe that foreign states are already using the AI chatbot for malicious purposes against other nations. This comes from a new study from BlackBerry, which surveyed 500 UK IT decision makers. They found that 60% of respondents see chat GPT as generally being used for good purposes. 72% are concerned by its potential to be used for malicious purposes when it comes to cybersecurity. In fact, Almost half, 48%, predicted that a successful cyber attack will be credited to the, to the technology within the next 12 months. The findings follow recent research, which shows how attackers can use ChatGPT to, to do things like enhance phishing and business email compromise scams uh, and the like, as well as just, you know, write buffer overflows and other, you know, kind of malware basics and that kind of stuff. You know, David, this is an open question, uh, you know, maybe suggest... 12 months is about 11 months too long, perhaps seeing how quickly we're iterating on chat GPT and generative AI in general, uh, you know, it might reflect maybe an, uh, perhaps an underestimation to the adaptability of cyber criminals in that they're going to throw all the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. If it doesn't work on month one, it, it's a, you know, these are, these are free tools, at least for now. So why not keep trying? We spoke about chat GPT earlier, obviously, but do you have any additional comments about this particular survey? Yeah, we just can't get away from this discussion. <laughs> I, I think this continues to reinforce what we discussed, though. Um, I, I think back to the cloud technology example I gave. And and when that stuff first came off, all security professionals in a lot of cases swore off the technology as evil. And oh, yeah. um, don't put our data in, in, in the cloud. You know, it's super dangerous. And uh, they would only tell the business no. And really, the business still pushes forward, right? They see the value in it. They're going to invest in it. And it really led to a lot of security uh, teams being behind. Um, and it left us catching up uh, with the business and um, who are who are really investing in that technology. So I, I think that just reiterates that. But if in this particular example, if you if you look at the pace of how much this has just developed in the last few weeks as as it's been really available, I agree. Twelve months just may be too long. Uh, we need to be thinking about this now. And um, in, in this particular example, there was an, an article, um, I think it was CyberArk Labs uh, that recently demonstrated using ChatGT, um, they generated polymorphic malware. Yep. And it went undetected, as they said, by most malware products. Um, and this should give us some levels of concern, of course, uh, and really reinforce that our attackers are going to continue to evolve just like information security. And if we don't keep up, we're going to be left behind. Yeah, and especially, you know, as we talk about things like the cyber skill shortage and that kind of stuff, finding ways, again, obviously, there are a lot of reasons to not want to just go whole hog when, uh, you know, these these generative AIs have no interest in necessarily presenting the truth, but finding ways to extract business value out of them, as opposed to saying, you know, we, we can't use these knowing we already know that we've seen hacker forums and, and people trying to test the limits of what they can do with these and similar systems. So yeah, for sure. I think the cloud example is, is spot on. So thank you. Thank you so much. David Nolan, the VP of Enterprise Risk and Chief Information Security Officer at Aaron's. Before we get you out of here, is there any story that you reacted strongly to, maybe a thumbs up or an eye roller uh, that really stood out to you? 
Uh, I'm going to cheat and uh, I'm going to say chat GPT. Obviously, it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the hot topic. I'm gonna actually going to give it both ratings, if that's allowed. Okay. Yes, um, I, I'm going to give it a thumbs up from the perspective of it, it shows positives um, for technology teams. And uh, mm-hmm. you mentioned Microsoft's investment in it. Other big players are investing, investing billions of dollars in open AI uh, and its productivity uh, boosting potential. So uh, thumbs up from, from what could come of this. Um, but of course, got to roll my eyes at it as well, because it, it presents a real risk to us. Um, it's a, a real aid to the attackers as well. It's, it's potentially already being used on the malicious side and and something we shouldn't wait to get in front of. Um, of course, w- we need to be realis- realistic technologists, though, and realize that this will be the future. We need to educate ourselves, embrace the potential business and security benefits of it, while still having a, a healthy concern for the potential implications it can bring. So chat GPT and open AI, AI it's an exciting topic. It's not going to be the, the last time we talk about it. We need to keep our eyes on it, but it's just starting. Yeah, and I think uh, if you're playing your um, week in review bingo, we're going to have ChatGPT be the free space, I feel like, for the next couple of months, if not for 2023. Well, David, where can people find you online if they are so inclined to uh, follow you there? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Come check me there. Excellent. Well, thank you, David Nolan, once again for your time, your expertise, and all of your spicy hot takes. Truly, truly appreciated. Thanks also to our sponsor, Hunters. Mitigate real threats faster and more reliably than SIM. A reminder to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday. Our topic of discussion will be hacking your security program, an hour of critical thinking of what you should do next to improve your security posture. That'll be followed, of course, by the Week in Review show. And in the meantime, you can get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines. What are you doing? Give us six minutes every single day. We'll get you all caught up. You can also subscribe to the show through a newsletter on LinkedIn. You can follow David on there. Then you can subscribe to the newsletter. There you can read and hear the show right from your inbox. Just go to CISO Series page on LinkedIn to subscribe. Until next time, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.